so much for joining us this morning. Thank you for joining us online. It's so good to, uh, to gather together to worship, to declare uh, the praises of our great God. Amen? Uh, a few years ago, I uh, took a group of students to uh, Colorado on a uh, high adventure trip, some high ropes course, uh, rock climbing, uh, whitewater rafting, all these amazing things. And then on the last day, we do a peak climb. And uh, it's not amazing. Uh, how many of you have ever done a peak climb? I know Bruce, I know Bruce and St- I see them back here visiting from Texas. Good to see you guys. Uh, anybody else done a peak climb before? 14,000 foot mountain? Okay. Um, so for us flatlanders, it's like a death march. Uh, it's so it's, it's like terrible. So the last day we do this peak climb and uh, um, our guide, Kent, is always like, you need to get up there and get back. You need to get up there and get back. Why? Why would he say that? Does anybody know? Anybody know about the mountains? What happens in the mountains? Storms all the time, right? So storms will always roll in. And so he's like, we need to get up there and get back. And, uh, and so we get up to the top, and, um, and I'm like dying. I'm like, this is a great view. This is awesome. And they're like, we got to get going. And I'm like, I want to enjoy this. He's like, no, you got to get down. And because you can see storms coming, right? And so, and as you're walking down, your legs just feel like jello. And so you're trying to like walk down the mountain and not fall on your face. And uh, we finally make it down to the, to the bottom, get in the vans, and uh, you can see these storms. I mean, they're just like rolling in. And, uh, and so we, we get in the vans and we start heading back to camp. And uh, as we're driving, you get down to this plateau area and there's all these buffalo, right? And so, and so I look at Kent and I'm like, Kent, I'm like, Cause you notice that the buffalo, right? Storms come and at, and the buffalo actually turn and they start heading into the storm. And I'm like, Kent, why, why are the buffalo heading into the storm? And he's like, well, first of all, they're not buffalo. <laughs> did, did you know this? I didn't know that. There's no, there's no buffalo in North America. It's bison, right? And so, so he's like, it's bison. I'm like, okay, whatever, right? So they're by, why are the bison running into the storm? And he's like, it's actually really unique. They're the only animal that will head into a storm instead of away from it. And, and he was telling me why. Because it minimizes the amount of storm that they have to, um, that they have to go through. Right? So like if you head into the storm, the storm's going one way, you're going the other way. It minimizes the time that you're in the storm. And uh, so it's pretty unique. Um, we, like every other animal, want to avoid the storm. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I mean, we, we, when, when we see trials coming, when we see a storm coming, when we see suffering coming, when we see pain coming, what do we want to do? We want to avoid it. We want to run away from it. And what ends up happening is we can't outrun it. And, and we end up spending more time in that suffering and in that pain than we actually need to. Um, the next section of the Apostles' Creed that we're going to look at today is a reminder that our Jesus ran into the storm. That our Savior is a suffering Savior. And, um, and, and so if you've been with us for the last couple of weeks, we've been walking through the Apostles' Creed. And one of the things that we've been saying uh, over the last couple of weeks is that this creed, this creed that our spiritual ancestors recited for hundreds of years, right? We, we are standing on the shoulders of hundreds and thousands of brothers and sisters who have gone before us. And they have used this creed. To, to remind themselves about the essentials of the gospel, to remind themselves of what is really um, important and true and essential. We said that last week. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to look at this picture um, that Jesus runs into the storm, that he runs into suffering, that he doesn't avoid it. And so I want to read the Apostles' Creed. And you can kind of follow along. Um, It says this, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord. We unpacked that last week, that Jesus is God, that, that that he has sonship, and he also has lordship. Okay, so that he is God and he is Lord, um, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate. He was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. 
The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church. Calm down. We'll talk about that in a couple weeks. The communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. This is the picture. This is the picture of what is essential to us as followers of Jesus Christ. Um, There is no other book, okay, look at me. There is no other book that can stand the test of sorrow and suffering like the Bible. Right? I mean, we can read books for pleasure. We can read books that intrigue us. We can, we can read books um, to entertain us. We can read all of these other books. But listen to me. When things are dark and our hearts are heavy, where do we run? We run to the Bible. Because no other book can stand the test of sorrow and suffering like the Bible. And, and when I think of Jesus, when I, what I want to think of when I think of Jesus is glory and honor and power and dominion and sovereignty, right? Those are the things. Like when I think of Jesus, those are the things that I want to think about. And yet Jesus isn't just sovereign. He also suffers. In Jesus, we don't just see glory. We also see agony. In Jesus, we we don't just see dominion. We also see death. This is what we're going to try and unpack this morning. You ready for it? Let's pray together. Father, we come before you. And uh, Lord, I pray. Lord, I know many of us have a a really good understanding of, of the love of Jesus and the grace and the mercy of God and His power and His dominion. We have a really good understanding of those things. But God, I believe that that many of us in this room, many of us watching online, may not have a, a very thorough understanding of the suffering of Jesus, the pain that Jesus endured. And so, Lord, I pray today that you would open our eyes, that we would understand, that you'd open our minds. God, that you would drive these truths so deep into our heart God, that we would walk out of this place grateful for all that Jesus has done for us. And if you agree with that prayer, say amen. Um, Death. Death. It's an interesting, when we were gathering together with the worship team and the tech team before the first service, I I started off by saying, okay, what what do you think of when you think of death? And uh, the rest of the meeting kind of went downhill from there. It was a little... Uh, it's a little bit of a downer, but the reality is, right, that we, um, we don't love talking about death. We don't love thinking about death. And, and for most of us, we fear death, even as followers of Jesus, okay? So don't, I know you're, some of you are super Christians, okay? But hold on a second. Many of us fear death because we fear the unknown. Like, even from what we know from Scripture, there's still this, like, unknown, unmet like un- uncertain mystery out there about what happens when we die. And that can be fearful. The ancients pictured death as a pitiless divinity. When we, today we picture death, right, we picture it as the grim reaper with a, with a sickle in hand. Or we think of a skeleton or, or a skull and crossbones, In the book of Job, death is referred to as the king of terrors. In Psalm 55, it says this, The terrors of death have fallen upon me. In Revelation chapter 6, we read about a couple of horses. The red horse of war, the black horse of famine, followed by the pale horse on whose back rides what? Death. And the grave follows. There is no way to hide the awesome, fearful, terrible presence and reality of death. We cannot avoid it. We try. (laughs) We try really hard, don't we? 
We are not the only ones to fear death, okay? So now super Christians, right? Like, I'm I'm not afraid of dying. Jesus himself said in John chapter 12, these are his words, Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. Jesus himself. I mean, I know you're awesome. But Jesus himself feared death. In Gethsemane, he prayed in an agony that brought blood from his pores. He's praying and pleading that the Father would remove this cup of wrath, this cup of death from him. You and I are subject to death. You want to know why? Because it's the penalty of the curse of sin. Ezekiel 18 says, the soul that sins shall die. That's us. That's all of us, right? Romans 6.23 says, for the wages of sin is death. We face death because of our sin. Do you hear me? We face death because of our sin. I mean, obviously, it's Genesis 3, the curse brings about death. But guess what? You and I sin. And we face death because of our sin, not Jesus. Death had no claim on him. He was free from the penalty and curse of sin. That's why he came. He didn't deserve to suffer. And yet he ran towards it. Who for the joy set before him endured the cross. Jesus didn't deserve to suffer and he still ran towards it. Did you know that Jesus said at one time, he said there were 12 legions of angels that were ready. Do you know how many that is? 72,000 angels that were ready to come to Jesus' rescue. And Jesus goes like this. Hold off. He was free from the penalty and the curse of sin. And yet, the angels couldn't keep the king of kings from suffering and dying. I want you to turn with me in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2, we we get this picture of what Jesus endured, what Jesus went through. Hebrews chapter 2 is a... um, So if you you know about the book of Hebrews, uh, the author, which we don't really know who the author is, the author of Hebrews is writing to a group of Christians who are being persecuted who are being persecuted, they are suffering as followers of Jesus. Now, we as Americans, we have no idea what it means to suffer. I mean, sometimes we talk about it. We're like, oh, man, I'm just suffering for the Lord right now. And like, we just, we have no idea, right? I mean, can we be honest with ourselves? We have no idea what it means to suffer. The author of Hebrews is writing to this group of Christians that is experiencing suffering that we will never experience. And the author of Hebrews is saying, listen, Your Savior, your Lord, your King ran into the storm of suffering. And because he did that, you can endure as well. And so this is the context. This is what what, uh, the author of Hebrews is writing. So Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9, it says this. But we see him, Jesus, who for a little while was made lower than the angels, Okay, so you you get this picture, right? Jesus um, is at the right hand of the Father, and and at some point in history, he puts on flesh, he puts on skin, and he comes to this earth as Emmanuel, God with us, the incarnation. He puts on skin so that he can become like us, so that he can become lower than angels. Look what it says, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor. Look at this, this is interesting crowned with glory and honor because of. Now, this isn't saying that Jesus didn't have glory and honor before this, but but the author of Hebrews is making a point. Crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death. 
So Jesus already has glory and honor. He puts on flesh. He comes to earth. And he, because he suffers, he receives glory and honor. Look at this. Why? He didn't just come to earth, put skin on, and suffer so that he would get more glory and honor. Look what it says. So that by the grace of God, he might what? Say it. You need to say it. That he might taste death. That he might taste death. What's the next, what's the next word? For, for. Here, here's the thing. Hooper Pontos, for everyone. Hooper Pontos, for everyone. Jesus tasted death for, instead of, in place of you. Jesus wasn't the only person to be crucified. You know that, right? There, I mean, thousands and thousands and thousands of people have been crucified throughout history. Jesus wasn't the only person to ever be crucified, but he was the only one who was crucified for someone else. He tasted death. Now, when, when you taste something, right, you're like, well, I'll just take a little bite of it, okay? Have you ever had somebody, um, this is going to be a shame on you thing, okay? I'm just warning you. Uh, have you ever had somebody uh, taste something and like, oh, this is disgusting, try it? Do you ever had that? Who's done that to you? Has, have you done that to somebody? Stop it. What are you doing? Why would you do? This is disgusting. You should try it. No. Okay. Now listen, that's not the tasting we're talking about. Okay. Like take a little bite of this. That's not what we're talking about. When it says that Jesus tasted death, it means that Jesus took the entire cup of wrath against sin. And he took it upon himself. The cup of wrath, the the wrath of God's towards sin. The wrath of God's towards whose sin? Whose? Yours. Jesus tasted death, Hooper Pontos, for you, for everyone. The cross is an incredible picture of all the facets of life. Right? It's a little bit like a diamond. There's all these different sides and angles that you can look at it from. So if you want to know the depravity of sin, look at the cross. You want to know the love of God, look at the cross. If you want to know, if you, if you want to know uh, the depths of humanity and, and the disgustingness of, of what life brings, look at the cross. You want to see the grace of God, look at the cross. It's just all these pictures, all these facets. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 10. So Jesus tastes death for us. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 10. Let's keep going. It says this, for it was fitting that he, Jesus, for whom uh, for, for whom and by whom all things exist, right? He created all things in bringing many sons to glory should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. Here, here's what that's saying. The author, uh, the author of Hebrews is saying that the suffering of Jesus was part of God's plan and purpose from the beginning. The suffering of Jesus was part of God's plan and purpose for what reason? To bring us to glory. To bring us to glory. I have no idea what that means. I'm serious. I, I've like studied, I've read it, I've looked up, I've looked up commentaries, all of this stuff. Listen to me. Here's what I know. I don't know what it means, but I know I want it. I am thankful for the suffering of Jesus because I get glory. And I have no idea what that looks like. says in Romans, Paul says in Romans, that the suffering of this present time doesn't compare to the glory that's going to be revealed. 
Listen, you and I cannot, we cannot even wrap our mind around what that means. But we want it, don't we? To gain glory, to gain glory, we need to walk through the glades of Gethsemane. To gain glory, we need to endure the awful hours of Calvary. To gain glory, we need to experience the silence and the darkness of the grave. If we really want to understand the glory that God has in store for us, we have to understand the suffering of Jesus. What Jesus had to endure was for the purpose of bringing us to glory. Amen? The result of Jesus' suffering, here it is. The result of Jesus' suffering is our redemption. You know what it means to redeem something, right? You pay, you pay for something. I'm redeeming this. I'm paying for it. Jesus paid for your redemption with his suffering. He died so that you don't have to. Isaiah 53 says this, He was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his stripes we are healed. All of the fury and the judgment and the wrath of God against sin that should have fallen on us fell on Jesus. All, did you hear what I just said? All of the wrath and judgment of heaven towards sin should have fallen on us. And instead, it fell on Jesus. That's a good place for an amen. Amen. (laughs) Jesus took your punishment. He tasted death for us. Jump down to verse 14, Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews 2, 14. It says this, Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, Right? So, so we, we are flesh and blood. We're human beings. Okay? Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things. That's just saying Jesus became like us. He, he put on flesh. Okay? So that what? Why did Jesus do that? So that what? That through death. You guys, listen, this is so amazing. That through death, he might destroy the one who has the power of death. That is the devil, Satan. Listen, listen, listen to this. This this is crazy. The only thing, the only thing that Satan has power over, the only thing that Satan has dominion over is death. He has dominion over death and Jesus died so that he could take the keys from them. So that Jesus, Jesus had to die. He had to put on flesh. He had to die so that he could go and take that power away from Satan. Revelation chapter 1, verse 18. Jesus says, I am he who lives and was dead. I am he who lives and was dead. Listen to this. And behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of Hades and death. (laughs) Jesus had to enter into Satan's lair and take away the one thing that he had power over. And you know what? Here's the reality. Um... Here's why that's important. We don't have to fear death. Look at verse 15. That through death he might destroy the one who is the power of death, that is the devil, verse 15, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. Jesus says, I got the keys. You no longer have to be afraid. You no longer have to fear 
death. I'm no longer a slave to fear. Right? We've, we've sung that song before. This is it. This, this is the reality of what Jesus has done for us. He's delivered all of those who through the fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. The death of Jesus becomes the doorway to glory. That's good news, isn't it? He suffered death so that we could have life. He became poor so that we might become rich. He tasted death for us so that we don't have to experience the wrath and judgment of God. I, um, I hope we don't die. Does that sound weird? Anybody in favor of that? We do it, right? I mean, we, we like our entire life, we're like, listen, figure it out. Doctors, medicine, let's figure out how to live longer. We don't want to die. You want to know why? Because you weren't made to. God created you for eternity. You know that, right? God created you to live forever. Stupid Genesis 3. <laughs> Can I say that? I'm, I don't know. Edit that out. Uh, I, listen, we... We were created to live forever. It's why we hate death. It's why we fear death. It's why we try to avoid death. I hope we don't die. How sweet would it be to experience 1 Thessalonians 4? If you haven't read it, you got to read it. Because listen to me. There's going to be a point of time in the future. <laughs> I hope it's soon. There's going to be a point of time in the future where Jesus comes and he rends the heavens. And, and Scripture says we will meet him where? We're going to meet him in the air. That we will meet him in the air and we will escape death. We won't have to finish out 2020. <laughs> Anybody in favor? Right? Man, I hope we don't die. Here's the reality. <laughs> reality check. As the worship team comes up, when we die, when we die, we don't have to be afraid. Jesus ran towards the storm of suffering and death. I had a lady in the first service come up afterwards and uh, she was taking real copious notes and she drew a picture. She drew a picture. She's like, I just wanted you to see this. She's like, this is what I picture. She drew a picture of Jesus standing and, and there was a storm over the top of him. And it, and it was almost like he was parting the storm. And Jesus runs towards the storm of suffering and death. And here, listen to me. If we follow him, if we follow him, we're in the right spot. We're in the safest spot. Jesus puts on flesh. He walks on this earth. I, man, I, we, I'm sorry. This is, this, this is my apology to you as, as a pastor. We should, have, we should have taken like an entire year and did the Apostles' Creed. Because honestly, we could have taken one word this week and we could have just said, let's talk about suffering under Pontius Pilate. And next week we'll look at crucified. And next week we'll look at die. And next week, right? I mean, we could have done that. It, we, could have, we could have spent a lot more time trying to unpack this. And here's the big picture. Jesus puts on flesh. 
He comes to this earth. He walks on this earth for 33 years. He gathers a, a group of misfits around him, and he says, come and follow me. Come and follow me. Just watch me for a while. He's like, just watch me for a while. Now I want you to join me. We're going to do some stuff together. Now, now you go out and you go do some stuff and I'll watch you. And then he goes into Jerusalem. And he experiences the most excruciating form of torture that anybody could... Some people have defined crucifixion as dying a thousand deaths. And that's what Jesus did. His flesh was ripped from his back. The guards took a crown of thorns. They shoved it into his skull. They put a robe around him and they gave him a staff and put it in his hand. Then they grabbed the staff from him, threw the robe over his head, and they beat him and beat him and beat him. And mockingly, they, they yell at Jesus and they say, tell us who... Tell us who hit you. If you're really the son of God, tell us who was holding the stick. They took him out and they laid a beam on his back. They said, we need you to carry it up that hill. Mind you, the flesh on his back is gone. He suffered. He walks up that hill to Calvary. They place him on that cross and he's gasping for breath as he's nailed to a tree gasping for breath Hooper Pontos he's tasting death for you they bury him they roll a tomb in front of they roll a stone in front of the tomb and the disciples, they're like, it's over. It's over. We spent three years with this guy, and this is it? It's over. They bury him. And then he came back. Matthew 27, they bury him. And in Matthew 28, we hear these words. Do not be afraid. I am with you. Jesus ran into the storm of suffering and death, and he came out the other side and he said, you don't have to be afraid. I'm with you. Let's pray. Father, we believe. <laughs> we believe in God the Father Almighty, the maker, the creator, the designer of heaven and earth. We believe in Jesus Christ, his son, our Lord, born of the Virgin Mary, we believe that he suffered under Pontius Pilate. We believe that he was crucified. We believe that he died. We believe that he was buried. 
And God, we believe that because of all of those things, because of the suffering of Jesus, because of the the death of Jesus, because of the burial of Jesus, we don't have to be afraid. That he did those things, Hooper Pontos, for everyone. That he did those things for me. So God, we thank you this morning for tasting death for us. And we stand and we sing and we declare these things to you because we truly believe them. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand.